as you can see, our worship team is quite a bit bigger today with all the different VBS animals that we have up on stage and the very large, true to scale, VBS mascot that we have on the back wall there, which kind of terrifies me a little bit looking at it as well. But as you can tell, VBS is this week starting tonight from 6 to 8.30. We're super excited for it. Um, with a couple, now I will throw this out there as well, we could always use a little bit more help. We've had a couple sicknesses, people had to drop out. If you have felt God's pull to sign up and help lead at VBS, now's your chance. Now there's a, an extra open spot for you. So we're really excited about that, all that God will be doing uh, through the different things we'll be talking about this week and how God's word inspires us and helps us to grow and as the catchphrase of the VBS is, is we're exploring the coolest book on the planet. Uh, and we've got all these different things to, to help us show just how unique God's word is and how it challenges our lives. All the different animals have different points to it. And I think it also shows just how much God's creation points to how good he is as well. Uh, so that is tonight from, from 6 to 8.30 uh, all the way through Thursday. It's totally free. You can register online through our website or uh, the, the, during the time right before it starts, we'll have some paper registrations as well. But we're really looking forward to it. And if you aren't able to make it uh, or, or to, uh, to be there as helpers, we just ask that you pray for us. <laughs> Not as a pray of like, oh, no, we've got to deal with a whole bunch of kids this week because that's exciting. But pray that God's word is shared and that kids' lives are changed forever by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's one big thing this week. Another very big thing this week is Missions Week out at Lake James Christian Camp. Uh, always a super exciting time. Even if you're helping with VBS in the evening, they've got classes and, and things all throughout the day. So from breakfast, I think, at 8 a.m. all the way uh, till, I think, 10 o'clock is when the last program ends and everybody goes back to sleep. There's always different things you can do. If you'd like a schedule of some of the different things to do at Missions Week, uh, just let us know. And I think it's also on their website. So two really big things happening, Missions Week out at camp, uh, go and support the way that God is at work all over the world. Uh, and it's truly amazing to hear the way God is at work uh, through these missionaries and through the, the work uh, of God's people. And it's something that's super exciting to me. Uh, and so before we can uh, begin and worship, I just want to pray uh, for all these things and for God to be at work in our <laughs> lives today. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you for the joy that only you can truly bring, whether that joy uh, is expressed through, through VBS and the songs and the, uh, the skits and the laughter and the encouragement that we share, or God, whether that joy comes from hearing about how lives are being changed all over the world. God, we just pray that you are here with us today that you lead us in worship, that you lead us into your word, help us to grow together, help us to encourage one another, and help us to be better followers of you. God, we pray all of this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Would you please stand as we begin in worship?
Yeah. 
us his one and only son to save. God so loved the world that he gave us. God so loved the world. One of my favorite things about that song is it's just based on John 3.16. One of the first verses you might hear at VBS or at Sunday school, or maybe for the first time today. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. That's the good news of the gospel, and it's what we celebrate. It's what we sing about today. And, and as I was looking for one more song to add this morning, uh, I walked into the sanctuary, and I saw all the VBS animals up on stage, and I saw all the, the different things we'll be talking about this week. And I was just thinking how God speaks so much through his creation, uh, through the animals that he creates, through the mountains and the valleys. I mean, there's no shortage of verses about uh, metaphors with mountains and valleys and seas, oceans and, and fields and everything in between and how God's creation speaks to his goodness. And we also read in the Bible about how if God's people aren't going to sing out and worship, then the rocks will cry out and worship God. And I think that's something we can all do today is as all creatures, as all God's people, to sing to him and to be thankful for all that he's done for us.
So we've got children's church as well for any of those who like to send kids down uh, to the worship park. They always do such a wonderful job and it's kind of a nice prelude to VBS uh, where kids will all worship God together and, and dive into some of the stories that many of us have grown up on. Uh, it was always such a wonderful time. Let's go to God in prayer before we take communion. Father God, once again, we thank you for this time you've given us to worship you. And God, for this time of communion. God, we pray that we remember the sacrifice that made our joy, our hope, and our peace possible uh, of your son on the cross. God, that we remember the power uh, that you have to defeat death itself and to rise up from that grave, uh, bringing about a new glorious day. God, we pray that as we take communion, we reflect upon our own sins, our own shortcomings, and our own failures, and just lay them down at your feet. Because, God, we know that you, since you've overcome death, you can overcome anything. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Great to see everybody here, and welcome to our guest. I think from the missions week at the camp, it's great to see you also. Here at Pleasant View, we do hold the emblems and partake together as a body of believers. Those communion elements are in the corners of the church. Uh, if you can't get them, make sure you get, somebody will get one for you. And if for some reason we do run out or you're not comfortable taking communion that way, uh, we'll be glad to accommodate you in any way that makes you feel comfortable. You know what I was doing, when I was sitting there as we were singing, I kind of probably had the same thoughts that Lee had last week, how God is so good at putting the puzzle together because we do not coordinate communion with any of our music or any th or the sermon. Uh, and he was, the song, the second song we sang was lay it at the feet of Jesus. You know, and to do that, you need to open your hand I am one that uh, can fill my mind with just useless information that I see. And I was watching a TV show, and the people in the tropics, wherever monkeys live, have discovered that if they take a gourd and cut a hole in the gourd and put a bait in there, depending on where they're at, I guess, what bait they use, and tether that to the ground, that monkey sees him doing it, and he'll run over there and stick his paw in there and grab a hold of that bait, and the people will see that he's got it, and the monkey is so dumb that he won't let go. All he has to do is open his hand, and he's free. He can pull his hand out of there and run, but he doesn't, and I'm sure we can all imagine what's gonna happen to that monkey. He's probably going to be on somebody's dinner table. But I, I got to thinking how we can do the same thing. You know, we can find something that we just hang on to, and Satan is so good at it. It's like these guys that fish. If the fish aren't biting, they just keep throwing another bait. They throw another bait out there until they start biting. And Satan can do that too. So we're almost do the same thing those monkeys do. We just grab a hold of something in our life that's just, we know, we know that it's a sin or something that's burdening us, and we just hang on and we hang on and we hang on, not knowing that all we have to do is let go and there's freedom. You know, and I think that's why we're right here at communion. You know, if you're sitting out there this morning and there's something that uh, you've got a hold of, and you're afraid to let go because you don't know what's going to happen. When you hold those communion elements this morning, your hand will be open. You're free because Jesus paid the price for us. And he loves us so much that no matter what problem we're going through in life right now, he will solve that for us and walk through us. So let's go to prayer. We just thank you, Father God, today for all you've given us. And Lord, I just pray this morning that... Uh, Forgive me 
for all those things I hang on to and just so afraid to let go of. Lord, help me today and help all those today in this church that if they're troubled with something, help them open their hands and lay it at the feet of Jesus because he died on that cross for us. And that's what we celebrate right now is the love that he had for us. We pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. And this is from the book of Mark. While they were reading, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and saying, Take this, this is my body, let us do likewise. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now we'll take a minute to pray over our offerings. The offering stations are at the back of the church, and there is an opportunity that you can give online or electronically. I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm sure (laughs) you can do it. Father God, we just uh, praise you and give you the glory for all that you've given us in our life. It's our time now, Lord, to give back to you and help us to give to you with a... uh, grateful heart. Lord, I pray that we take the offerings that are presented today through you and help to further a kingdom on earth. We pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. It's good to see everybody here this morning. I know we have a number from out church camp missions week. We're glad you gracious with your presence here today and hope you're blessed as well. Next Sunday, as you know, uh, Joe Hines is going to be here from Woodburn Christian Children's Home. We've got Christmas in July for the church camp, church camp, the children's home. Some of you may not have gotten a gift card name. If you still want to get a $25 gift card from Kohl's, you can bring it next week, even though maybe we ran out of names for you to do that. You're more than welcome to do that. But Joe also wanted us to announce that during the Sunday school time, he will be giving a missions update on the children's home but also uh, he's going to be sharing some helpful I'm going to quote him helpful tips for parents and grandparents to raise children in this messy culture including practical insights in child development and conflict management so you're going to get more than just an update next week can I move these Stephen he's not paying attention to me but that's all right I told Ella I gave you guys what Oh, you're taking notes? All right, okay. I told Ella, last week I gave you guys 12 minutes. It was a short sermon. I didn't give them to you. I put them in the bank, and I'm withdrawing them this week. So just thought I'd tell you that, so you can be ready on that. Um, I don't know if it was Lee or Stephen. I'm not good at coming up with catchy little phrases for sermons. I'm horrible at that. I always have been. Stephen's not taking credit for it. He's giving credit to Lee. Uh, So I said, give me some help. So thank goodness for Geritol. I quizzed the Meyer girls to see which one was smarter. Neither one of them knew what Geritol was. (laughs) How many of you really don't know what Geritol is? (laughs) No, I'm not singing any songs. Well, we're talking about technically aging with joy. And I I know it wasn't done on purpose, but I kind of laughed because I always, for those of you that are visiting, I usually sit in the back next to the sound room on a chair until it's time for me to come up. Somebody put a walker next to my chair. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was intentionally. Uh, oh, you, that's okay. That's all right. 
For those of you that are here for Missions Week, you've never been here before, I get no respect. So it's no problem whatsoever. I don't know that I really deserve any. Uh, I could go into story after story after story about my kids and how they can kid me about the same stories, same jokes, same illustrations, how much I talking about going to the Gooley River, right? Lily up in Canada and stuff like that. And I keep saying, when I'm dead and gone, you're going to be sitting around saying, boy, we miss dad to make fun of him, but they'll probably still make fun of me. Well, we're going to talk about aging today, but we're going to talk about aging with joy. You, you hear a lot of phraseology about aging with grace, but we're going to talk about aging with joy. Now, I'm going to go back to the first Christmas. It's kind of apropos. Next week is Christmas in July for the children's home. We got all this winter-like looking stuff up here. But you remember back on that very first Christmas, you remember what the shepherds said to the angels? Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people unto you that is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, those circumstances weren't very joyful. Stop and think. The Israelites, they were being bullied by the Roman soldiers. Mary and Joseph were poor. Uh, the Christ child was born in an unsanitary stable. The shepherds worked the night shift. But inside of all of these negative things, the angel said to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So we're going to talk about this great joy that we should be finding in the sunset years of our lives. Now, for those of you who might think this sermon has nothing to do with me, because I'm not even close to the sunset years of my life, well, let me give you a spoiler alert. You're headed there, and you're headed there a lot faster than you think you are. <laughs> as simple as that. I was 34 years old when I moved to northeast Indiana. Look what's happened to me. And, and, you know, I've been here for almost 40 years now. And I look back and I think, where in the world did that time go? It just seems like the other day when I first moved up uh, to Blackman Lake and 40 years have passed. And I know those of you that are older, maybe some that aren't all that old, might be thinking the exact same thing. Now, we Christians, Scripture tells us, are supposed to be distinctively joyful. Just before Jesus died, uh, hours before this, he said to his disciples, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. The Apostle Paul, when he was talking about the fruits of the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. But now, unfortunately, uh, over the years, I encounter a lot of older Christians. And I'm not talking about maturity spiritually, but just old in age who aren't very joyful. A lot of times their lives are characterized by complaining about what's wrong with them physically, longing for the past when they were more important, criticizing the younger generation for not showing their proper respect, whining about how horrible the government or the school or the church have become. And unfortunately, many times I see people, the older they get, the more sour they become. One teenage boy claimed that his grandfather had OCD. A friend said, you mean he has obsessive compulsive disorder? He said, no, he's old, cranky, and dangerous. <laughs> you, you hear people all the time talking, and the three-letter word I challenge you to come up with, I got a lot of funny responses. Uh, it was interesting. Yeah, Jeff, was, Jeff had a good one. He had ice with exclamation marks after it. Derek, in his great wisdom, just simply put P. Um, but anyway, that's not it. Marilyn's the only one that got it right. It's a but. Let me illustrate. Have a good 4th of July? Yeah, but, boy, I work like a dog with all those kids around all day. Leaves are pretty, aren't they, this fall? Yeah, but, you know what that means, winter's around the corner. Good church service day? Yeah, but, I wish they'd sung some more songs that I knew. And boy, that carry-in meal at church was great. Yeah, but, I had to wait in a long time, and then my favorite food was already gone. Good speaker today, yeah, but he went a little bit too long. You remember the movie Grumpy Old Men, Walter Matthau, Jack Lemon? If we're not careful, we can become grumpy old Christians, and we do not want to do that. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. I could go through so many illustrations, but as I was going over this sermon, two, two names came to mind, Lucille Van Wagner and Harry Reid. You don't know either one of those people. Lucille died a horrible death at an old age of cancer, and every time I go to see her, if she would even say one negative thing, she would immediately say, I don't have that much to complain about. And he'd, she'd ask me about other people in the church and how they were doing and how they pray for them. 
Harry Reid, an older guy that lived by himself for years and years and years, every time I go visit him, he always had a shirt and a tie on and a sweater. I say, Harry, how come you dress up every day like this? And he was in his 80s. He said, I just never know when somebody might come and see me, and I just want to be ready to have a good time visiting with him. When Harry went to the nursing home, he played piano. Uh, he found great joy in going down to the rec area and playing piano for all the... And I could go on and on with people who were aging and in tough circumstances, but they chose not to complain, but rather to be joyful. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord until you get to be 60 years old, and then it's all over. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not what it says. It says rejoice in the Lord always. Now, you know as well as I do that when an older person... Uh, are joyful. They're fun to be around. They also give a positive witness for Christ. But people who are old, cranky, and dangerous, they're not all that fun to be around. How many times have you ever heard anybody say, let's go to Charlie's house. He's the meanest, orneriest old cuss I know. But let's just go spend some time with him. No, nah, you, you don't say that. A little boy wrote, dear grandma, I hope you live all your life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I want you to go home today, no matter what your age, determined to be joyful and live your life to the fullest, whatever the circumstances. Now, sometimes that's not easy. The Bible does seem to indicate that the years between 70 and 80, they're, they're full of a lot of trouble and sorrow. Now, it's not always easy to be joyful when your body hurts. And, and I, as I see people come in sometimes on Sunday morning, uh, sometimes when I know they've got an ailment, a knee or a hip or a shoulder, or something I'm gone through or going through, we, we, we kind of talk about that a little bit. Uh, when the body hurts, when people disappoint you, when the future is uncertain, when a loved one dies, it's a little tougher to be joyful. So I'm going to share four important things that we can do to be joyful in our twilight years. And again, those of you that are younger, pay attention, because the freight train is headed that way, and it's going to be there before you know it. The first one. Be confident of your salvation through Jesus Christ so you don't fear death. To be joyful in the present, you have to have hope for the future. You see, hope and joy go hand in hand. Now, I can understand why non-Christians become cranky and crotchety as they get older. Because their life's behind them. And, and if they don't have Christ, they don't have anything to look forward to. Their idea is we're just roadkill. Here today, vaporized, gone tomorrow. And, and they have no reason for hope. But if you're an aging Christian, you can still have a spirit of joy because we recognize the scripture tells us the best is yet to be. Apostle Paul wrote about that in his second letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we don't lose heart, though outwardly we waste away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. So if you recognize that you're saved, your sins are forgiven and you're bound for heaven, and you can be joyful up to the very last breath you take, no matter what the circumstances. Now, I, I want to stop here just for a moment uh, and say to some who may be here, some who may be watching online right now, or you might be watching later in the week, if you've not accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, and, and you're putting your confidence and your hope in heaven by simply just living a Good life, uh, let me tell you, our goodness is like filthy rags before God's righteousness. You're only going to be saved. We are only going to be saved by putting our trust in the perfect work of Jesus Christ through the cross and admitting that we're not good enough. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Isaiah chapter 42 says, The Messiah comes to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. And that's the way you are if you're outside of Christ. He came to release you from that, to give you hope 
in eternity. So if you've never become a Christian, if you're watching online, you need to get a hold of somebody. Uh, you, there's not a lot of time left. Don't be putting your trust in self, but in Christ. And claim the promise, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But you know, also thinking about this, I've also observed in a number of older believers, they're not quite as confident as they should be because they haven't lived a perfect life since they become a Christian. Well, I became a Christian when I was 12 years old. Uh, I was baptized in the Whitewater River, uh, down near the little town of Whitewater where I grew up at. And, and I remember Johnny Green and Kathy Cox, we were baptized, the three of us together. And, and I can remember the feeling of having my sins forgiven. But I've lived 61 years since that. And I do not have time this morning to list all the sins I have committed in those 61 years. They piled up. And sometimes when we start thinking about that, we wonder, am I still going to be saved because of the sins I've committed since I became a Christian? Well, let's look at Simon Peter. He didn't live a perfect life after he became a Christian. Three years after he left his nest and followed Christ, he denied that he even knew Jesus. And even after the Holy Spirit came on him and he preached that phenomenal sermon on the day of Pentecost, he kind of bounced back to his old racist attitudes about the Gentiles so much that the Apostle Paul said, I had to rebuke him to his face. Yet Peter didn't doubt his salvation, even though he wasn't perfect. The Apostle Paul became a Christian 20 years after he had that dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus. He wrote this to the Romans. He said, the good that I want to do, I don't always do. The evil that I don't want to do, I gravitate toward. What a wretched man I am. But he didn't doubt his salvation because he went on and said, who's going to deliver me? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So it's important that we understand as we grow older in our older years that what happened years ago when we accepted Christ and were baptized, our sins weren't just washed away, but we were adopted into the family of God because we became his children. 1 John 3, 1 says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. Let me ask you a question. All of you that are parents or grandparents, how many sins will your children or your grandchildren commit against you and you still forgive them? Indefinitely. Infinity, over and over and over again. Why? Because they're a part of your family. Did you hear about the shortest will that was ever written? Being of sound mind, I spent it all. <laughs> I don't know if you want to hear that when you read your will or anything like that. Do you have any ideas how many times I have seriously threatened to change my will and write one of my kids out of my will? Never. I'm not even close. Have my kids disappointed me like I'm sure I disappointed my parents? Of course. But guess what? They're still my kids. Understand this. You were adopted into God's family. And I guarantee you God is a much better and a more loving and gracious father than I am or any of you are. He loves you with an everlasting love. And even though we have been imperfect, he didn't write you out of the will. 2 Timothy 2, 12 and 13, Paul is talking about this. He said, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Now, now what's that mean? I believe very clearly it says, if you blatantly say, I don't want anything to do with God anymore. I want Jesus out of my life. He's going to do that for you. But... As we go through life and we do forget those, or we do commit those sins that we do time and time and time again, those times when we might think we're a little faithless, but we're not deliberately saying, I don't want you, God, he remains faithful because he's promised eternal life to us. He's adopted us into his family. One of my favorite songs is, It Is Well With My Soul. Uh, the last stanza, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in the part, but the whole, not just when I was baptized, but all my sins has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, 
O my soul. So I say to you very seriously this morning, every sin you've ever committed, every sin you will ever commit has been nailed to the cross, and you will bear it no more if you remain loyal to God, if you always desire to have Christ as your Savior. If you try your best, not that we're going to be perfect, but we just try each day to live our lives for Him. If you're going to live a life of joy, you have to have confidence in the love and the grace of God that you're saved. Secondly, choose to be joyful every day regardless of circumstances. A book that was very popular a number of years ago by Drs. Merrith and Meyer, it was called Happiness is a Choice. And I believe that. I believe happiness is a choice. There is this ebb and flow uh, according to what happens to us, and, and those things do play a part. But the more I observe life, the more I'm convinced that contentment is a mindset. Joy is a daily choice. I've seen it too many times. My mind wanders when I'm doing these sermons to people that have crossed my path. My very first church down in Kentucky, Goodloe Davison. Uh, he and his wife, dirt poor, didn't have a vehicle, put out a little uh, vegetable patch, tried to sell it. I don't know how many times he'd call me up and say, Preacher, can you drive me around? Uh, I got some vegetables to sell. And I'd gladly go driving, but they were happy and content. But somebody just looked on the, at them from the outside would think, my guys, says, dirt poor hillbillies. I wouldn't want to live like that. But they had Jesus and his love in their hearts. And because of that, they chose to be joyful, to be content, to be happy. You see, you choose every day to be cranky or content. You choose every day to be dismal or joyful. Before you get out of bed in the morning, I challenge you to say, this is the day the Lord has made. And I can be grumpy and grouchy and ruin it and waste it and drag everybody down. Or I can rejoice and be glad. And I choose to rejoice and be glad and live this day to the fullest. We can't choose our circumstances all the time. I know that. But you can choose to refrain from griping and complaining all day. The Bible tells us do everything without complaining. Maybe you don't feel good. But let me tell you the truth. Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to hear you're griping. Nobody wants to hear you're complaining. Unless you're talking to your doctor or unless you're talking to your husband or wife when they are in a deep, sound sleep. That's the only time you should ever complain to somebody. You understand what I'm saying? Your doctor's about the only one because you're paying him to listen to you gripe and complain about your aches and pains. Other than that, you know, nobody wants to hear it. You don't want to be around people like that. Ben Merrill. He's over 90 years old, and he's still preaching. He is the minister at large for the Harvester Christian Church in St. Louis, and he said this, most of the good that is accomplished in the world is accomplished by somebody who doesn't feel very well at the moment. How many athletes talk about how they're feeling terrible, yet they had a great game because they put it on the line? That's the way we are in our Christian life. You can choose not to gripe and complain. You can choose to laugh out loud several times a day. The Bible says a merry heart does good like medicine. I believe, and, and I love jokes, I love joy, uh, I try to make people laugh, sometimes to their, their annoyance, especially my family, but you can choose to develop this cheerful countenance, laughing out loud, exercising those muscles in your face in the proper way. We're told, medically, as we get older, our muscles droop, our skin sags, we get those wings, you know, stuff like that. And you wonder where in the world this thing come from when you look in the mirror. Well, you young ones, you laugh. Just wait, just wait. The day is coming. I woke up one morning, looked in the mirror, and went, geez Louise, what happened last night? You know, th those things happen to you all of a sudden. You can let all that happen and never smile or anything, and you're going to end up looking like Donald Trump. <laughs> That's not political or anything. Just look at the man. I don't want that countenance on my face. Or you can save, spend thousands of dollars and, and get facelift after facelift and look like Kenny Rogers right before he died, <laughs> an old scarecrow. But you can save all this money and have the look you want if you just smile a lot. It lifts your face. It lifts your spirit. There's an old button that said, if you've got the love of Jesus in your heart, notify your face. And a lot of people need to do that. You know, they're just not that joyful. Jesus said, if you're fasting... Don't let the world know that you're fasting. Wash your face. Comb your hair. 
put on a cheerful countenance to the world, and your heavenly Father who sees you struggling in secret will reward you openly. Because some people say, wait a minute, preacher. If you're smiling all the time, even though circumstances are that, aren't that good, that's being fake. That, that's obedience. Is what the Bible says we're supposed to do. William James said, if you act the way you wish, you'll feel, you'll eventually, excuse me, if you act the way you wish you felt, you'll eventually feel the way you act. We're told in 1 Peter 4, 13, Rejoice in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Why in the world would we want to rejoice when we're suffering? Well, Peter here is saying when we do, in a way we're participating in the sufferings of Jesus. When you hurt physically, maybe we can somehow identify with the pain that Jesus felt when those crown of thorns was placed on his brow are those nails in his feet and hands. If you suffer emotionally stressed, you can think of Jesus and what he endured, hostile critics, slow learners, incessant demands, constant interruptions. Maybe you feel alienated from a relationship. Remember Jesus' own brothers mocked him. Judas betrayed him. Simon Peter let him down when the chips were there. All forsook him and left. Corrie Tien Boom, in her, one of her books, wrote that when she and her sister Bethsy were first confined to a Nazi prison camp, one of the first things that happened to her and her sister and all the women was that they had to strip and march naked, single file, in front of the leering eyes, the jeering comments of the German guards. She said it was humiliating. But as she stood behind her sister Bethsy, looking at all those bare shoulder blades in front of her, all of a sudden she heard Bethsy say, Oh, Corrie. They took Jesus' clothing, too. And Corey said, I responded, oh, Betsy, I, I never thanked him for that. You see, when we go through suffering, it helps you appreciate the suffering that Jesus went through for us. And also, maybe more importantly, well, I do believe more importantly, when you go through suffering, you can rejoice because it's, an, a, it's your opportunity for your witness to be enhanced. When you hurt, the spotlight's on you. People know, pretty much everybody you know knows if you're a Christian or not. And when we go through those tough times, people are watching us to see if our faith is real, to listen to what kind of words come out of our mouth, what kind of response do we have when the pressure's on. Jeff was kind of sharing a little bit about a 80-some-year-old person who was trying to use their phone and try and get on some site. And all of a sudden, she, he said, I heard these terrible words coming out of this 80-some-year-old lady's mouth at her phone. Uh, people watch us. They listen about what comes out of our mouth, our attitudes, and stuff like that. Scars enhance your credibility. Nobody wants to go through pain, but you have the opportunity to witness that you may not have had otherwise. I asked Tammy if I could mention this. She said, sure. Look at Tammy and her battle with cancer and how she uses that day after day after day as a strong witness for her faith in the Lord. When you go through suffering, you appreciate what Jesus went through for you. It enhances your testimony, puts a spotlight on you, and yes, we can rejoice in that. Third thing, become increasingly generous with your resources. Jesus said it's more blessed to receive. No, he didn't say that, did he? He says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, we know that's true. But a lot of times when we get older, the problem is we, we, we've saved for all these years up until we get into these twilight years, hoping we've saved enough. And we save more and more and more, and we do those calculating. How, how many more years am I going to live? How much money do I need and all these things? Do I have enough? And a lot of times, a lot of people store up a whole lot more than they need. Uh, I remember a guy when I was preaching at Milroy. Phil Carter was his name. The outside of the building, it was an old brick building. It needed tuck pointing, and it needed it bad. And it was a small church. And I remember he got up, and I got so tickled. He got up, and he says, I want to say something to all you old people. You ever be cracking some of those nest eggs where they start to rot underneath you? We need to fix this church building up. That was a pretty blunt announcement, but he kind of got the point across. You know, and sometimes that's the way we are. We get our self-worth out of our portfolio. And, and therefore, we get into this habit of just storing it up and storing it up and storing it up. But if you want to be joyful in, in your later years, learn to give it away. You're not going to take it with you. How many times have you heard me say, and as long as I'm here, you'll hear me say it time and time again, 
Give your kids and your grandkids money when they need it. When they're in college, do your best to get them through that college without any more student debt than possible. Help your grandkids when they're in college. When they're buying that first house, when they're raising those kids, that's when you need to help them. You probably find out if you're really generous and you help them a lot during those times, they may come and see you a whole lot more too. You know, let's go see grandpa and grandma. Maybe they'll give us some, no, you know, that's not why you do it, but that's what happens sometimes. Don't wait until you're old and you die and they're in their 60s or something like that. If they need your money then, excuse me, they're probably bums unless there's some extenuating circumstances. They should be kind of financially solvent themselves. And so be generous to your kids and your grandkids during those times when they need it. Luke 16, 9 says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. We're talking about Christmas a little bit. You want to have a joyful Christmas this year? Drop some serious cash on your kids and grandkids. Some of you that got parents in the audience are saying, yeah, yeah. but anyway, drop some serious cash and, and see how they react to that. It's a whole lot better to me to see the joyful smiles and faces while I can rather than later on when I can't. You might be thinking, wait a minute, preacher, I don't have a whole lot of money. Okay. If you don't have extra money, give away time. That not only applies to spending time with your family and your friends, but also the church. I still believe and I'll believe to the day I die, some of the biggest untapped resources as far as time in the church is retired people. I know you get busy, but you only get busy doing what you choose to do. Uh, I love it when somebody comes and says, man, I'm so busy, I can't. And I said, are you punching a clock? Well, no. I said, well, then you're busy because you're choosing to be busy. You're choosing to do these things. Put the church in there. I guarantee you there's so many things, whether it's working with the VBS, whether it's working in junior church, whether it's doing stuff around the building, there's always something that needs to be done. Use your time wisely. And the most joyful thing in your life is to serve instead of sitting around walking your dog or watching hours of gun smoke reruns like I do sometimes. <laughs> okay, maybe you don't have much money, you don't have much time. You got valuables you don't use anymore? Jewelry, china, tools, stuff like that that you're never going to use again. I don't know how to exactly phrase this, but one of the things that I found some great joy in after Marcia passed away was telling the kids to come and get what you want. You know, I, we had some collection stuff that I probably got to get some money out of and stuff like that. But rather than that, as I was downsizing, I said, you guys come and get what you want. Now, I said, stay away from my fishing stuff. But I said, get, you know, as far as the other stuff that's in here, these collectibles, things on the wall, all this kind of stuff, just, just get what you want. And that was a blessing to me as I watched them do this. I, if you want to experience joy, I, I challenge you to start giving stuff away, whether it's finances, whether it's time, or whether it's treasures. And you're going to have some great joy. Here's one more thing. If you want to be joyful, spend an increasing amount of time thinking about what awaits you in heaven. Get your focus off of this world and on to the next. Jesus said in John 14, do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And what did he say next? In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you, and where I am, I'll come and get you to be with me. The apostle wrote, Paul wrote to the church at Colossae in 3.1, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your minds on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. You see, the reason I believe as we get older that we get glum and we fight depression is we're always looking down, if you will. Our health's failing, and it does. Our kids are drifting away because they have their own lives, and they do. People we love die, and they do. Our possessions don't bring us satisfaction like it used to. And we see this world no longer as satisfying, and we let that get us down. Scripture tells us, lift your heads up. Cast your eyes up towards heaven. Your redemption is near. Begin to think about what awaits you in heaven. As I get older, I, I think more and more about heaven. And, and I bet you do, too. It seems like every time I turn around, uh, I, I'm getting a call from my cousin Janice 
or I'm looking on Johnson's website or something like that, and I see that another classmate has died. I get a call from the family, and another first cousin's gone. I, I told Stephen, uh, I think when he did his sister's wedding, I said, when you first start out in ministry, you do a whole bunch of weddings. Pretty soon you're just going to be doing funerals for your family. And, and that's the way that it is. That's the way that it is. So many that I love deeply have already gone to be with the Lord. Now, the old saying, I have more friends in heaven than I have on earth, gets truer and truer and truer the older you get. Now, I'm going to share very quickly in closing here in just a second three things about heaven that I believe are going to surprise you. But before I do, I was going to see if Chris could get it up here, but he couldn't. So this is going to be your job here in a minute, young lady. Be ready. You're going to be my timer. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. And I want you to look at someone real close to you and say, I think when we get to heaven, I'm going to be surprised at, and you fill it in. Now, disclaimer, don't be saying and pointing to somebody, I'm going to be surprised if he's in heaven. No, we don't be doing that. Don't be mentioning names or anything like that, okay? I don't want to see no fingers pointing or nothing like that. But I'm going to give you 60 seconds, and I want you to look at the person closest to you and exchange the statement, I think when we get to heaven, I'm going to be surprised at. Are you ready, Ella? Time me, 60 seconds, go. You have to talk, people. You two can talk to each other right here. You still have time. Ella hadn't stopped you yet. Keep going. <laughs> Gary, you can tell Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Ten seconds. Oh, that's it. Time's up. I saw a lot of smiles. I heard a lot of laughter. I, I would love to be able to record it. Now, I'm not going to ask you to share anything like that. We just don't have time. But you know, we need to do a little bit more than that. The Bible says, I has not seen nor heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. One of the things I think we're going to be shocked at is the awesomeness of God. The Bible says nobody has ever seen God and lived. Moses, he didn't even see God. He was permitted to see the backside of God, but just think. Someday we're going to see the one that could design the DNA molecules, frame the human body. Scripture says he's so awesome that he holds the ocean in the palm of his hand. It says with the breath of his hand he measures the heavens. And he carries the dust of the earth in a basket. That's what Isaiah said about God. Can you imagine seeing him face to face? The Bible says God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. What are we going to do when we first see God face to face? I'm anxious to see that. Another thing, I will be surprised at the multitude and the majesty uh, of the angels. In, in the Christmas story that I referred to earlier, it says, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor trust. And, and the shepherds were terrified. There is this spirit world that we do not see. The Bible says there's legions of angels. Jesus said, I could have called 10,000 angels, and they would have come to my rescue. And when our eyes are open spiritually on that day when we enter into heaven, I, I believe that revelation of all those angels uh, I just can't even begin to imagine that another thing I believe we're going to be surprised at how good we feel immediately now I get made fun of a lot but my family and friends especially Stephen in that little parody song that he did uh, even mentioned it at my 50 years in the ministry party that Canada is my happy place. Show the pictures, Chris. I keep forgetting it's not back. That's my happy place. 
I sit there, and, and my daughter and son-in-law won't admit it, but a lot of times when we're not out fishing, if you look over in front of their cabin where this view's from, they're out there on those zero-gravity reclining chairs just staring. Peace, quiet, no TV, no cell phones, no text. Hardly anybody else lives on that lake. Quiet. The beauty of God's creation. And that is my happy place. Because the minute I get there, I have this feeling of relaxation. I have this feeling of total peace, if you will. You can take that off if you want to, Chris. I believe we're so accustomed to living in these bodies riddled with pain and imperfections, breathing all this polluted air and all the stuff that's going on in this world. The Bible even says all creation is groaning. And man, are we groaning. And I believe the first breath that we take in heaven, we're going to say, man, I wish I'd come here a whole lot sooner. This is great. Paul told the church at Corinth in his first letter, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the hard hearts the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But set your affections not on the things of the earth, but on the things that are above. That's what I'm talking about this morning. Living a life of joy, regardless of salvation. And that attractiveness to others will direct them to Jesus. The assurance of salvation, my friends, the best is yet to be. Let's pray. Father, we're so undeserving. I know I'm so undeserving of all that you've prepared for me. But Father, I'm thankful that you gave the path to salvation to your son as he came here to earth. As he took on the pain and the sorrow that we can't even begin to imagine, but yet he lived that victorious life. The life that led to his death, his burial, but his resurrection. That Father gives us the pathway to spend eternity with you. Help us, Father, to be Christians that are joyful. The world so, creation is so groaning. The world needs to see the joy that we have through you, that no matter what's going on around us or within us, we're still praising you and living that life of joy. I don't, we, I don't believe we can even begin to imagine that, Father, but maybe keep our eyes focused on you. To your son's name we pray, amen. Let's be standing, shall we?
to my knees or will I fall will I sing hallelujah will I be able to speak at all I can only got a good friend every newsletter article every letter he always used the phrase Larry would always say keep your eyes on the Sun son it's the only way to go through life keep your eyes on the Sun folks have a great day just want to remind everyone next week we'll have the Woodburn Christian Children's Home service here Joe Hines will be preaching doing Sunday school and if you got any of these other gift cards yet to get back get us get those to us beforehand uh, and also August 3rd is the youth group Cedar Point trip, $50, covers the ride there, ride back, the ticket and everything, you have to buy your own drinks, but that's August 3rd. And if we could get a couple people as well, right after service, we've got some more tables we'd like to set up down in the fellowship hall for VBS. If we get four to five people, it'll only take a couple of minutes. But thank everybody for coming to service this morning. We hope you have a fantastic week. Mm -hmm.